So if you're struggling with a baby who is colicky and you don't even know what colic is, but they're burping and not able to hold down food and they're screaming and crying, it's a huge issue. And so I want to take this opportunity to speak with a mom who was struggling with this for quite some time and she's going to share her story, what she did to try to figure out what was going on and her journey with it. So Katie, thanks for being here with me. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to share this with other moms. Yeah, you you reached out via Instagram uh, directly, which I greatly appreciate. And you're like, Ben, what what's up, man? Why why aren't you talking more about this? And and because uh, it's a huge issue, and especially since I'm passionate about kids and optimizing lives of unborn children, and then unborn children become babies. You know, this is a, a directly to my heart, and I got three boys of my own, and. And one of which was the firstborn was horribly uh, uncomfortable all the time, was always bouncing him, always colicky. And I didn't know what to do at that point. I had no idea. And uh, but you did your homework. And so tell us your story. What happened? Yeah. So um, I actually have two kids that were like that. Um, both of them, the first, my daughter, Lily, and my son, Maverick, who's 14 months old now. And right around two weeks old in both of their lives they went from like these perfectly happy babies to screaming their brains out all day long like you said i mean trying everything all of the techniques all of the things people tell you to do we were trying them and they weren't working obviously that can be really taxing on a new mom and i'm a pretty natural minded person myself i delivered my daughter in a birthing tub my kids both were delivered without drugs i really am passionate about that and so I was looking for pediatricians all over Atlanta, which is where we lived at the time. I found a woman who seemed to be okay with spacing vaccines and seemed pretty natural minded. And so I had her and we had been in to see her maybe one or two times at that point. And right around two weeks, uh, my daughter Lily just started screaming. Her butt was red. She was like flushed all over her face and spitting up projectile vomiting. We just like couldn't do anything to make her comfortable. And instantly over the phone, she said to me, oh, she's got reflux. I'm going to call in a prescription for Xanta. And I'm like, what? I'm going to put my newborn baby on a PPI? Like, and you haven't even seen her in person yet. And it just felt wrong. And I think moms try to like ignore their mom gut too often and I knew that that wasn't right so I had this great doula and I called her crying just saying like we want to put her on Zantac the prescription's already called in I don't feel good about this and luckily we have um an IBCLC in Atlanta she actually lives in Tampa now Amy Hammond she runs Tampa Breastfeeding Center she is like an angel on earth and I went in to see her Lily's right around two weeks old. And I just tell her she is miserable. She can't eat. She's like choking every time she eats and she's spitting up all over the place. She's like, okay, you know, let's sit you down. Let's watch a nursing session. And instantly we could tell she was struggling to feed. And most people think that that's a tongue tie issue or there's something else going on. But we came to find out that at of, you know, two weeks old, 14 days old, she was getting three ounces of milk when she, her stomach was about this big. So I was just making way, way too much breast milk for her and she couldn't handle it. The same thing ended up happening with my son. We think that the oversupply I had came from a full thyroidectomy I had when I was 19. Um, just messing up my hormones for life. <laughs> but my kids both really struggled and we didn't figure out exactly what the problem was with her belly in time to fix it for her. But with my son, we ended up finding out what was going on. And that's where you come in. <laughs> yeah, so IBLC. So uh, tell folks, what, what is that? Yeah, so an IBCLC, there's lactation consultants, um, and then there's international board certified lactation consultants, which is IBCLC. I tend to recommend to my blog followers and my friends to see an IBCLC just because they have more training. And lactation consultants are great if everything is going great. You know, if you need a little help with a latch, um, if you're in the hospital, you've never breastfed before, they can be wonderful resources. But they are missing out on like a lot of the clinical experience that an IBCLC would see in their office and they're dealing with more intense cases. They can just be a really good resource for anything. I actually 
just would recommend any mom going as soon as they have a baby, if they're nursing at all. 100%. I'm totally on board. And, and uh, you know, I actually took, uh, when I was in med school, I actually took a lactation class. Um, it was in the midwifery department, but I was like, you know, this is an important thing to study. So and then I also took another class called maternal infant and uh, human nutrition, which is also a, another great class. But I, I still did not know nearly enough. And then when I um, started speaking with these inter international certified lactational consultants, I was like, wow, this is a whole new world. There's so much to learn. So much to learn. And, and so when you have a, a, a struggling baby who is, you know, not swallowing or not latching or your nipples are really, really sore um, or they're burping up your food, you know, their food, but your breast milk, uh, you know, seeking out uh, these individuals are, are key. And uh, where, do, where would they find uh, them? Is there a website or how do you? How do you I say believe that? there is. Um, I think if you just type in IBCLC in your city, you'll probably be able to find one. I know Amy Hammett, who I go to, is doing phone consultations now during the quarantine. So that could be a really helpful resource. And I think a lot of them can do that or maybe video chatting so they can see what's going on. Mm -hmm. But if you're able to see one in person, what they do is uh, before a feed, they'll weigh your baby on a scale naked and then they'll have you feed them and weigh them afterwards, which is great because a lot of moms, their biggest concern is, is my baby getting enough milk? And like, they can literally show you right there. Okay, yes or no. Or in my case, your baby's getting too much. Oh, that's interesting. And uh, so what type of scale do they use for that? You know, I actually think that there's one that you can buy too. Um, I can't remember the name of it. You can buy one for home, but it's just like the same scale that they have at a pediatrician's office that you lay your baby down when they're born. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, they get them fully unclothed or, you know, if they're wearing a diaper or whatever, and they're able to weigh them right before and right after. So you can tell the ounce changes, especially in a baby that little. Brilliant. Yeah. And we're, yeah. we're hitting these points because I, you know, it's sometimes it's not as easy as, the solution which we're going to present right so some you know right. it's i don't want to say you got lucky because you know you, you you did it you've done a lot of your due diligence you did a lot of research you sought out you know professionals of, of the highest caliber that you could and did how did you find the solution so what what was the path that you took here yeah and i will just say that not you were saying like lucky and it's true not all women have access to people like this. I always say that if I didn't have my doula with all these resources, like what would I be doing? You know, I would have never figured this out. Um, so anyways, I went to see Amy uh, with uh, my son and uh, her coworker, Carrie Ann um, in Georgia. And so I brought my son in and we were good to go the first two weeks. He had a great latch, everything was good. Two weeks on the dot, same thing as my daughter starts screaming his brains out. So I bring him back in and I remember them telling me about lactose overload with my daughter and I didn't pay much attention to it. Um, I wasn't doing the protocol correctly because I was just a new mom and frazzled and didn't know what to do. So with my son, I said, hey, is this that lactose overload thing you had told me about last time? And instantly both of them were like, yes, that's what's happening here. And I had never really thought about what lactose overload was. I just assumed that that meant I was eating too much cow's milk. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, they explained it to me in great detail. And now I am very, very familiar. So what happens is um, babies are born with immature microbiomes. They do not have enough um, lactase enzyme to digest a lot of lactose and lactose is naturally occurring in all moms whether you have cow's milk or not we make lacto lactose so what's happening in babies that um, their mothers have too much milk or a fast milk ejection reflex is the mom has not two different types of milk but the milk kind of comes in two different concentrations so there's four milk uh, which is a watery milk that has an excess of lactose and then towards the back of your breast close to where the milk ducts are there's the hind milk that is the high fat milk um, and lower in lactose so what happens with moms with oversupply is their babies are nursing but they're only getting that four milk because there's so much milk that the baby's never making it all the way to the back of the breast. So they're getting all of this lactose in their belly, none of the fat. So it's 
nutritionally like compromise um, comparable because they can still grow even if they're having just the four milk but they're not getting the fatty milk so they're nursing 45 minutes later they're hungry again because they didn't get enough of the fat to fill them up and the hard. trouble is yeah the trouble is they don't have enough of the lactase enzyme in their gut so when it gets down to that and the small intestines not making enough, they're just being overloaded with lactose and their colon can't digest it fast enough. They're pooping out mucus. Occasionally they're pooping out blood. They're screaming, they're spitting up, they're nursing more frequently, which is causing more lactose to go into their body and making the problem worse. And, you know, in today's world where a lot of babies are born via c-section or they have sterilized a mom's vagina they are not getting that healthy microbiome to be able to digest this and even in my case with having two natural births my baby still didn't have enough so that's what we ended up finding out what was going on with our kids and luckily there are, are things you can do about it our suggestions were that you pump a little bit off before you feed if you have an excess milk supply or if your milk's coming out really fast. So there are these great little silicone pumps. I don't know if you've seen them before, um, but they're not like actual breast pumps. They're about this big. You can suction them onto your breasts. And if you have a lot of milk, normally it'll just flow out. So you can kind of attach those, get you know, just a letdown down one to three minutes of a pump out or a manual pump and then latch your baby on. Uh, that's really helpful, but doesn't totally solve the problem because once your baby is already in this lactose overload state, they need a little bit more of that lactase enzyme to help them break down the milk. So Amy had suggested to me that I had taken Seeking Health lactase enzyme um, well, sorry, not me take it, but give it to my son. And she explained to me how it worked, basically just giving him that extra amount of enzyme to break down that lactose that was in my milk. And how did you give it to him? So I originally was giving it to him on a spoon and she told me that she's kind of changed her recommendations now because there's so much mom error in that. Or if you put it directly on your nipple, it can fall off. So what she says to do now is just drop it right in the baby's mouth. And I had done that once or twice with my son. And really, it's just a taste thing. And he never cared. I never saw him squint his eyes or do anything. So she just suggests putting it directly in their mouth right before you start a feed. Yeah. I actually done that with my daughter and with him at the very beginning, like right after I had him. But the problem was I didn't realize the drops needed to be refrigerated, which is a huge component in this whole thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So once I refrigerated the drops, um, I switched them out every like week, week and a half to make sure that they were fresh. Um, and I would give him one or two drops either on a spoon or directly in his mouth and start the feed. And in three days, my son stopped screaming like night and day. It was life changing. So walk me through how your day was as a, as a mom. And then you're married as well. So, I mean, what, what was the situation like at home with, with your baby, you know, in pain and, and colicky and, and, you know, what was, what, how many, how much downtime was there? I mean, was it a constant stressor? I mean, what, what was, what was going on? Yeah. I mean, there's really no downtime with my daughter. It's worth mentioning that at two weeks old, my husband is a retired NFL player. And at the time um, he was playing for the Falcons when I had her and at two weeks old, he went to the Super Bowl um, in Houston. And so I am alone with a baby who is screaming bloody murder and leading up to the Super Bowl, I had to sleep in a different room with her because she was screaming so loud. I, you know, couldn't have her around him waking him up. And the same thing happened with my son. And I can't explain to you the toll it will take on a mother and a family. And now with my son, I have a toddler in the house and she's actually grown to not be super fond of her brother because he was screaming all the time for so long. And mm. we have to give attention to both kids. But what about when one kid can't be sat down for 10 seconds, you know? Um, I definitely had postpartum depression after my daughter. And I always said like, it wasn't a hormonal problem. It was literally situational. Like sh I didn't get more than four hours of sleep a night all day long. I'm alone. 
She's crying, crying, crying. She won't nap. She's so uncomfortable. And the mental torture you feel, we're like, I'm breastfeeding. I'm supposed to be doing the right thing for my baby. And my baby hates me. My baby hates my milk. I'm hurting my baby. And I remember with her, because we didn't really figure it out, is like just the torture I felt for months and months, feeling like I was hurting her. And what a psychological uh, problem that could become for a mom. And luckily with my son, I didn't get as down in the dumps, but right around the time that he was like seven or eight weeks old, I remember taking a walk with my husband, with my son screaming his brains out in his stroller and just thinking like, I want more kids and I don't think we can do this again. Like I must be hurting my baby. Like I must make tough babies. Like I'm doing something to them that's hurting them. And what an awful feeling for a new mom to have. Oh, for sure. Especially when you're making such an effort to do as much as you can naturally. You know, mm -hmm. That's exactly right. I mean, like I didn't have the drugs, <laughs> like, you know, the comfort of not feeling birth. Like I went through the whole thing. I tried to eat the best I could while I was pregnant. You know, I was taking tons of omega-3s, doing all the right things and, you know, hiring a doula. And I just... I was always under the impression that breastfeeding was the best thing for my child. And I'm watching my child writhe in pain every time I feed him or her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the trouble is we were talking about, you know, taking her to the pediatrician and taking him to the pediatrician. Like I had a holistic MD and my holistic MD and my pediatric gastroenterologist had no idea what lactose overload was literally no clue. When I told them I was going to be giving the lactase enzyme drops, they both told me, well, it's not going to hurt them. You know, there's nothing wrong with them, but it's not going to do anything. So you can do it if you want, but I wouldn't even bother. Had I listened to these people who are supposed to be professionals, my son would have continued screaming his brains out all day long for, I mean, three, four, five months. Who knows? Yeah. And, and their solution again was antacids, PPIs, Zantac, or what was it? Yeah, our holistic pediatrician wasn't all about that, but the, the pediatric GI was, and the first pediatrician I had seen with my daughter, that was the answer. And, you know, if I wanted to be sure that my baby had reflux, I had to take them in and get a really invasive test done. I remember just saying to them, like, all babies have reflux. <laughs> like, this is a normal developmental problem. Like, they are not even a problem, but a, a normal developmental step. They spit up. That's what babies do. Like they're, they don't have all of that matured yet. So I'm going to go give them a PPI, which in most cases they say doesn't even work. Now they're showing that it is causing um, a higher likelihood of fractures in young children. Oh yeah. And yeah. And I'm thinking, so I'm going to go mess up their microbiome, do all these things for, and even admittedly by them that it likely wouldn't do anything. I just couldn't stand the thought of doing that without like a proven diagnosis that something was wrong. And even then, if it, there's no guarantee that it's going to help, why am I bothering? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. for sure. And, and uh, you know, that's, you're, you're confiding in your pediatrician, you're, you're seeking them out as, as professionals and, you know, it's a shame and I'm not going to blame them because they're not taught this stuff. That's but, exactly right. You know, it's, they need to be listening to people like you. That's the one thing that I'm seeing an issue with is when, when doctors have a, in a person like you who is constantly seeking out uh, what can really help and, you know, you want an alternative to a, an antacid and you come forth with them and you show them, hey, this is what I use and this is the result. What did they say to you? Did you, did you ever go back and say, hey, I use this enzyme and it really makes a huge difference? I did. And um mostly ignored. <laughs> Truthfully, I, um, I feel really badly for other women that have been in my position. Oh my gosh, it's almost making me emotional. I can't tell you how many times I have went to see people just desperate to make my babies better and to have people who I trust say to me, like, I'm so sorry, there's nothing we can do. Your baby has colic and they'll just have to grow out of it. Or even worse, if my baby's having a good day or a good hour in the office, and they'll be like, they don't look so upset to me, you know, and just being turned away and acting like we're some crazy person because we're going to go see every lactation consultant or we're, you know, going to see an osteopath or we're seeing a chiropractor and just looked at as 
you know, you can do all of that stuff, but your baby just has colic. I mean, you don't even know what colic is. No one does. Right. And so, you know, yes, my baby is screaming for more than three hours a day, for more than three days a week, for more than three weeks at a time. It's like about triple that. So what's the solution here? I just have to sit and wait until they grow out of it. Like, why are we even settling for that? Why does anyone accept that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well done for, for persisting. And, uh, you know, it could have been really easy for you to just jump on the antacid train and, uh, you know, that would have reduced the, the acidity of your baby's stomach, uh, which would have then reduced the absorption of vitamin B12 and vitamin D, which then leads to bone issues and vitamin K and vitamin E, you know, and all these fat soluble vitamins and their digestibility of your milk also would go down. So, you know, it's a huge issue. And then their, their methylation would be messed up because of low uh, B12 absorption. And it would just be a, a downward spiral. Then there'd be asthma and eczema and, you know, and yeah, just, significant allergy, um, increase in chances of allergy as soon as they start taking those. And I don't know what you hear, but the women that I talk to and the friends that I have whose babies have been on PPIs all tell me like it barely did anything or it didn't help at all. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't, cause the lactose is still there. Yeah. That's exactly right. And if that is the problem that's happening in your baby, that's not going to do anything. Yeah. You know? I think back to feeling so vulnerable at that time, because at the time you're having a professional tell you what you should be doing. And I mean, it, the first pediatrician was adamant about this. Like, this is what's happening to your baby. And if you want to save your baby's esophagus, this is what you need to do. And I remember thinking like, I don't want my baby to scream anymore. And I know she's in pain, but like, this just does not seem right. Like I wouldn't take one of those as an adult. And so the thought of giving one of those to my brand new baby that's had nothing in their system at all, except breast milk and probiotics seems crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So walk us through again. So this is, this is an old, old bottle. It's like one of the original ones because this was actually one of the first supplements I ever designed. I've done over a hundred cents. So I think, you know, and I'm sitting, standing here uh, feeling guilty that I, you know, have not done a good enough job uh, about educating about this. And, and um, so I appreciate you reaching out immensely. Lactase drops, it comes in a dropper like, the, you know, it's a little glass bottle like this. It probably looks a little bit different because this is old, um, but there's a glass dropper in there and you, you mentioned, and which was absolutely right, to make sure that you keep it in the fridge. And then every time you breastfed, right, Katie, you, you uh, open the capsule and you dropped one to two drops right in the baby's mouth. Is that true? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, um, yeah, right before we fed, I know we kept it in the fridge for at least 48 hours before we ever used it the first time. Um, that was a recommendation by the, the IBCLC. So every time we were about to switch one out, we would put a new one in the fridge um, two days before. And then I used it with every single feed. So yes, this is a little bit frustrating when you have to do that in the middle of the night, but I can promise you it's a lot better than your baby screaming all day. So um, a solution if someone has, you know, an extra little mini fridge around and you want to keep a little bottle next to your bed, we found that to be really helpful. You could just plug in a mini fridge and have it right there for you in the middle of the night. We put it in his mouth before every feed. Okay. So I just want to make sure we're, we're totally on the same page for mom. So it's totally clear. Um, did you pump and store the milk and then add this to it? Or did you, um, and let it sit in the fridge for two, for 48 hours? Or did you, um, just prior to breastfeeding, you know, your babies woke up, is hungry and you, uh, opened this, gave them two drops directly in the mouth and then attached them to your breast and they ate. So you can do either. Um, if I were to pump a full pump, uh, I would put that in there at least a day or two ahead of time. Um, but one of the issues of oversupply in moms is that four milk, high milk imbalance. So if you're just pumping that first one to three minutes, and I say one to three minutes, by the way, because that is usually not enough to stimulate an already oversupply mom to make more milk. It's just to get that original letdown out. Um, so trying to keep that original pump under three minutes. So yeah, if I were just doing that, I would not. Um, I actually saved that milk for baths or I um, donated 
hundreds of ounces to milk uh, to the North Texas milk bank. Um, or you can save it for when your baby gets older and they can handle that lactose better. But I wouldn't suggest that first one to three minutes being something that you give to your baby in a bottle later that day, just because it doesn't have as much of that high milk in it. Um, but if you had a full pump where you did have that fatty milk and you were emptying or close to emptying your breast, then yeah, I would just put two drops in it, um, save it in the fridge in a bag. But what we did for my son, because he didn't really get super into bottles anyway, we would just put it directly in his mouth and then latch him on right after. Super easy. Yeah, it was a great uh, task for dad to get involved. He would have to bring the enzyme and be like, okay, it's enzyme time. Okay. It's pretty sweet. So I don't, did you ever taste the enzyme yourself? I didn't actually. No, I didn't know if it tasted bad or not. And that's why you like people had suggested mixing it with milk first or whatever. Um, but my son never squinted at it at all. Okay. So yeah, it's, it's, it's got a, a base of glycerin and, and water. So it's, 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 it's got a sweet taste to it. Glycerin, it helps stabilize the enzyme and keep the bacteria away. So that's why it's added in there. Um, it's not really a, made to make it sweet. Um, so, but you saw results, um, within, you said three days. Yeah. So on the third, uh, the end of the third day, my son had had like the best night that he had had in his, I mean, since he was two weeks old, um, he ended up catching a little cold after that. He was a little miserable for a day or two. And then after that, he was like a new baby. I mean, seriously, he was so much happier he did end up being a crankier kid just in general, but I have to tell you, Dr. Lynch, that I am convinced it is because he had all that inflammation in his gut for eight months, yeah. or sorry, eight weeks, and I didn't figure out the, the lactase enzyme in time. I am pretty sure that he struggled with gastric distress for a long time after that because of it, but I can't tell you, <laughs> I mean, seriously, how different he was. Like, as soon as those drops kicked in, it was like, seven to nine hours of screaming a day to like fussy, you know, having his periods on and on of, you know, being a baby. I remember looking at my husband and just hugging him and being like, oh my God, we finally figured it out. We did it. Like we solved colic in our child. We actually know what was wrong and this is it. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. And then you don't feel guilty. You feel that, you know, you're back to the healthy breast milk again and you're not poisoning your baby and being a bad mom. When you go to pediatricians, the next step after PPIs is switching to formula. And you'll actually hear from a lot of moms that, oh, I switched my baby to formula and my baby felt better and they were screaming less and they were sleeping all the time. And I'm sure you already know about this, but you know, there's an opioid-like peptide inside of bovine. So when we're giving this to babies, they're getting into this deep REM sleep and they're sleeping all day and they're tired. And Babies don't sleep long periods of time on breast milk because they're not supposed to. They're not supposed to get into this deep REM sleep. There is a reason for formula. It's kept babies and many of us alive. So I don't knock formula at all, but I'm just saying you're not solving the problem here or making things any better um, by switching them to formula and having your baby sleep all day and then just be happy because the baby's sleeping. Babies are supposed to wake up to want to feed. That is part of their biology. They don't make melatonin until like three or four months old. Yeah. So, you know, that's all part of the, the game. You're going to have to be awake and you're going to have to feed in the middle of the night, but your baby doesn't have to be unhappy during all of that. You certainly don't have, I mean, how many moms I've heard say I switched to formula and I felt so guilty about it, but it was the only option that I had. That shouldn't be the only option a mom has. If you want to breastfeed your child and help prevent, you know, all sorts of diseases as they get older, you should be able to do that and do that and feel confident that your milk isn't hurting them. If women just knew that this lactase enzyme existed and that lactose overload is a thing, I... I mean, I can't make any predictions, but I would think a significant amount of colic would be solved by that. Oh yeah, for sure. I did not have the lactase drops around with our first son. I was still in med school. Um, so, but uh, I did not do the research either um, as you did. And, and so he was, man, he was fussy. Um, and I, he was always in my arms or his mom's arms uh, and he was vertical. And I was, we were always bouncing him like this. Yep. 
always. Mm -hmm. He's trying to, you know, just shake the the air out of his stomach. So gassy. They probably had the mucusy poops, all that yeah. type of stuff, burning his butt because it was coming out so fast. I mean, babies were supposed to poop like a couple of times a day. My son pooped after every feed and he was on my boob every 45 minutes. I just like never ended all day long. And it's just running through his colon. He couldn't digest anything. It was just like getting out of him as fast as it was coming in. And that is, and that is opposite of what you needed for your oversupply because you kept feeding and then it would create more oh, milk and it just it was this exactly. vicious cycle you couldn't get out of such a vicious cycle and like i said especially with his end of the problem that the more he nursed the more lactose was going in his belly yeah and that was another part of starting those lactase drops is he was nursing so much less frequently and sleeping better at night because he was finally getting the right stuff in his belly to digest my milk. And the poops didn't get all the way better right away, but they were significantly better. I remember seeing seeds back in his poop at two months and I was like, oh my gosh, we did it. Like there's seeds in his poop. It's not just like green boogers in his diaper. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he just, he was so much happier. And again, that tip of, you know, pumping a little bit out before you feed is so critical too. Um, and I think the combination is perfect. Did you notice that your oversupply was diminishing or you were still producing a lot? It did. Um, so typically with a lot of moms right around six to eight weeks, it starts to regulate. Um, so that's why a lot of IBCLCs won't tell you to take any of the reducing herbs or anything until that time, um, which can be real rough for moms. And we knew that mine was so, so high that we actually did start the herbs somewhat earlier none of them worked. I tried peppermint and sage and all of the things, tinctures out there that I could get. None of them did anything. But once he started eating less frequently and we kind of got on a groove, I would say, yeah, right around like three to four months when he was finally all the way better, um, that really slowed down. Good. Good. Well, awesome. And yeah. I just, um, I think it, most moms will find that even if you have that original oversupply, you know, save some of that milk. I know it's annoying. I know you have to spend a lot of time. It really is not fun to stick on a pump in the middle of the night, but you'll have more of that milk for when they get a little bit older and they can digest that lactose better. And, you know, the, the four milk isn't a bad thing. It's great. I mean, you can use it for your baby, give it to them in the summer, put some ice in it. I was giving it to my toddler too, cause she was still on breast milk. Um, it's really, really helpful, but I don't think a lot of moms should go on the train of trying to reduce their breast milk or, uh, stop breastfeeding because of this. It's definitely not. Yeah. And, um, do you know the brand name or the, the pump name of, of the different types you use? Cause did you use like a full on pump and then also the silicone ones? I mean, what was the brand names of these? So yeah. So I tried to stay as far away from um, an electric pump as I could because I knew that that was going to stimulate my breast too much. Um, so I really like Haka is one of the brands that makes that silicone pump. There are several other brands. I think if you can just Google silicone pump, that's really helpful. Lansano is a great brand that I really trust. They make manual pumps like I was talking about that you just squeeze instead of hooking up to the wall. They also make the silicone pump with a little catcher around your neck because they often fall off because they're suctioned. So they're one of the only brands I know that has that. So if it falls, you don't lose all of your milk. Again, so that's Lansano and Haka. But if you just Google silicone pump, it'll pop up and you kind of roll the lips back on it and you suction it onto your breast. And if you do have that oversupply or the fast milk ejection reflex, it will just collect in there. And with my daughter, I had to hook up a pump every single time. And what a difference it was to just have that on because it was not stimulating my breast the way that the manual or the electric pump would have. Okay. And what did you store the milk in? So some days if I was really tired, it just sat on my nightstand until the morning. <laughs> Usually breast milk could actually sit out for about five, six hours at room temperature. Mm -hmm. um, but I put them in either uh, bottles in the fridge or I would put it in milk bags, date it. And we actually bought a deep freezer and I was able to fill that deep freezer in like a couple months. So that's why we ended up donating a lot of milk. Um, but a great resource too, for the moms that are listening to this that have oversupply, um, that there are milk banks all over the country, especially right now, um, desperate for milk. And you send in your milk and they um, 
they have to put it in, you know, like sanitize basically the milk. Um, and then they are able to ship it out to NICU babies all over the country. You fill out a form to make sure you're not on any crazy drugs or anything like that, but really helpful. And it can make you feel a little bit better about all the stress you have with your oversupply. It's, it's tough. I know that when I go places, if I talk about the oversupply of milk, people would always say to me like, oh, that's just too much of a good thing. Poor you. I don't have enough milk to feed my baby. But they don't realize how stressful that can be for moms and certainly shouldn't be shamed for being upset about having too much milk. If your baby's choking and screaming their brains out all day long, you have a right to be upset. Mm -hmm. Especially if most of that milk is full of lactose. That's exactly right. And I wanted to mention too, uh, most of those moms are likely struggling with plug ducts and mastitis and your optimal PC was also something I took religiously. Uh, I still do while I'm breastfeeding. I'm still breastfeeding my 15 month old um, and super helpful. Sunflower lecithin helps the milk get less sticky inside your breast so you don't get those plug ducts and mastitis all the time. And I just, I take it every day. Uh, twice a day. And then if I find a plug duct, which still happens occasionally, I'll take like two or three of them at a time. And by the next day, it's gone. Wow. Yeah. yeah my wife struggled with mastitis constantly. So she had, she had probably oversupply and she had the, you know, and we didn't, I had no clue about the phosphatidylcholine. I had no clue about the uh, lactase enzyme. So yeah, well done. And that was going to be my, one of my questions coming up when you, you just hit it. So the, the optimal PC is fantastic uh, for not only, you know, preventing mastitis, which is great, but, you know, it's also really helpful for your gallbladder. A lot of moms during pregnancy have gallbladder issues. Um, bile, uh, you know, gallbladder is, is possibly even removed right after um, from pregnancies um, for various reasons I won't get into. Um, so the optimal PC during pregnancy is massively important. And then also your baby's brain. Uh, is using that that phosphatidylcholine for for neurological development, and there was actually a study done um, uh, by a doctor, and I can't remember his name. Um, starts with a Z. Uh, uh, Zeisel, Doctor Zeisel, uh, multiple studies on choline and phosphatidylcholine, where they they looked at mice and they they put these baby mice in mazes, and throughout their life they measured to see how fast they can go through the maze. And the babies who uh, received a lot of choline during pregnancy and also in their early years as, as little baby mice uh, remembered uh, and were able to navigate the maze all throughout their life. So in other words, they never got dementia. Amazing. It was an equivalent to about 800 milligrams of phosphatidylcholine a day. Um, so 800 milligrams of, of optimal PC a day is going to be magical for not only mastitis and, and milk flow, which is huge in and of itself, but mm -hmm. your brain is going to be very, very protected their entire life too, which is unreal. Yeah, it, it's so important. I mean, I remember going off of it um, for maybe like a month or two, just getting lazy and the plug ducts came back immediately. Like, I obviously with oversupply just can't, you know, you try to sleep on your side one night and the whole side of your breast is on fire the next morning. Yeah. Um, so to take that every day and just be able to feel regulated and stop the waterfall and cascade of events that happens after a plug duct and then you have mastitis and now everybody's suggesting that you have to get on antibiotics to clear the mastitis and then that's affecting your baby and it's affecting you. You can kind of not fully prevent that, but there's a much less chance of you getting it when the milk's flowing properly out of your breast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well done. God. And, uh, you know, shoulda, woulda, coulda with, with our three boys, but, you know, you're, you're, you're doing great, great things by sharing this information. Uh, you've really inspired me to, to help you get this message out because it's an important one. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's it's hard knowing that I didn't stop that in time for my daughter. And I actually am starting to see signs of a leaky gut with her, even though she's been on all the right supplements and she has the, one of the cleanest diets of any child I know. I'm convinced it's because we didn't figure out that I have no proof of that, but that we didn't figure out this lactose overload sooner. And it probably just caused her a ton of gastric distress. And so now we're kind of dealing with the ramifications of that. So um, if I can help any other moms and 
I have already done so with writing a blog post about it. I get messages from women who find me on Google all the time saying like, oh my gosh, I can't even tell you these lactase drops changed my baby's life. Everyone's so much happier now. This is a totally different baby. And that just gives me a better feeling than anything else in the world. Like it might be too late for some of our kids, but if we can help any other newborn babies and any moms from going through this, I mean, think of what we could do for postpartum depression and what we could do for babies in pain. It's, it's really incredible. I am super grateful to you for making this product because my son just would not have been the same without it. Awesome. Yeah. Well, you're welcome. And again, thank you. And, and how many marriages would be happier as well? Oh, yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. Of course. I was going to say something else. What was it? Um, ah, gone. Oh, your, your leaky gut and your baby, uh, or not your baby, your daughter. How old is she now? She's three. Okay. Um, have you tried optimal GI powder for her? I have not. She's on the prebiota. Um, both of my kids are, uh, but I have not tried that on her. I should do oh, that. I would, can she eat apples at all? She can, yeah. So I would get some organic applesauce, definitely organic. I'm sure you would do anyway. I'm just saying that yeah. for others listening. Um, so get organic applesauce or whatever she loves eating and mix a bit of it in the applesauce. And because okay. uh, it by itself, it's not going to taste good. That way she'll be getting a lot of nutritional support for her gut, tons. And do it in the morning and, and you know, maybe in the afternoon don't do it within about five hours of bedtime because of the L-glutamine in there, which her stomach or small intestine really, really needs, um, can convert to L-glutamate, which can then lead to um, increased alertness and not sleeping. Uh, makes we sense. don't want to do that. So find out what that amount is for her. And I would just use a little bit of a bit in there. to. You want to make sure that she enjoys her food. Totally. So, just, just put a little bit in there to start, maybe a quarter teaspoon or a half a teaspoon and go with that and do it, you know, twice a day. And then maybe you can go to a little bit more after that. But I would say it's going to be, um, you know, it, it should really, really help her a lot. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. We just found a functional medicine uh, pediatrician out here in Santa Cruz, and she's a big fan of your products for a lot of um, the kids that she treats. So we're doing a bunch of testing on her to figure out exactly what's going on, but I'm definitely going to start her on that because it's changing her personality too. I mean, she's been a lot more aggressive. She's a super smart kid, but she's just been almost having like OCD tendencies and she's not sleeping as well. And this is really coming out of nowhere. So I'm assuming that it has a lot to do with the gut issues she's been dealing with forever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's a um, doctor's data has a very good stool test. Uh, it's uh, I don't know what the, the test is called by itself, but uh, doctor's data is a lab uh, based out of Chicago, Illinois. So you just send in the stool sample and they come back with, you know, what's, what's going on in there. It could be very, very useful. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm hoping that I can help her. I mean, think of too, how many of these kids are going through the exact same thing and we're just told it's normal toddler behavior. You'll just have to deal with it. Yeah, no, no, it's not. So You've done a lot. You've done great things and, and uh, appreciate you reaching out. So lactase drops, just open it with one to two drops right before feeding uh, every time. And then optimal PC, uh, you're using that uh, when and how. Are you doing the capsule or are you doing just the liquid itself? I do a capsule. So I take a capsule with lunch and one with dinner. And if I have... Um, if I end up having a plug duct, I usually will take two or three at a time. I don't know if that's your recommendation, but it works for me. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that I would, I would say, uh, say definitely go for it. Yeah, yeah. Making sure, or you can take them like four times throughout the day too. I know my, um, IBCLC said that that was fine, but I always make sure I up it when I'm feeling one coming on. And yeah. by the way, too, with a lot of babies, um, the lactose overload will start to get better, especially if you're using the drops right around three to four months. Um, I think that my son had it a little bit longer. We had to keep him on it, I think probably around five, six months we started to wean him off. Um, so this isn't something that you'll have to make this crazy investment for the rest of your baby's life. Just especially in the beginning, you're noticing, you know, gulping or chomping down in the nipple, trying to pace themselves. 
start those lactase enzyme enzymes immediately. They're safe for you. They're safe for the baby. Everything's cool. Lay back when you nurse, try to fight against gravity and just start it as soon as you can. And you may never notice your baby start screaming because he never suffered from the lactose overload anyway. Smart, smart. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're safe to use right at birth. I mean, they're, they're really gentle. So. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Katie. And uh, yeah, look forward to helping a lot of moms and dads and little babies. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yep. Take care.